Good evening all, and welcome. Tonight I have the pleasure of being joined by the insanely talented Night Stalker. He is a fellow horror narrator and I'm sure you'll love his content. He's narrating half of the stories for you today. When you're done here, please be sure to check out his channel and follow the link in the description and at the end in order to see the stories that I've done and feature over with him. I'd really appreciate it. So, don't forget to do that at the end. I'd really appreciate it. And sure you'll enjoy what we have in store. But for now, it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. I've been on Grinder for about 10 years, five of which were illegal, and I'm not proud of it, and I have had plenty of messed up experiences. This one in particular reminds me of when I was at a party without my car. I was 19 and in college, and my phone was on 10%, but a decently hot Grinder guy said he could pick me up and we could hang out at his place before he drove me home. So of course, I jumped at the opportunity. We got to his place and he got me pretty drunk, which is not unusual for me, but never tried to make a move. I assumed he was gonna just wait and convince me to stay the night later. And finally, my phone died after two hours. That last 1% lives a lot longer than the rest and I didn't even have to say anything before he noticed it was dead. Then he stood up and was like, well, let's go to the car then. When I asked if he had a charger I could use, he just said, no. After we got into the car, he got kind of quiet and less flirty, and I spaced out just enjoying his music and looking out the window. I didn't even notice that he never asked where I lived until I'd realized that we had been driving for over an hour, not even towards my town, but into the canyons, Greater Salt Lake City and Utah area. And I asked where he was going, and he just said, thought we could go for a drive. And my drunk ass was just like, oh, okay. So anyway, to make a long story short, he ended up taking us four or five miles down a dirt road with no signs or houses, until it led to this dead-ended road, with a cabin and no lights or cars. He parked the car and switched it off. That's when the dread started to creep in as I sobered up. I said I drank too much and should probably head home, but he didn't even respond. He just sat there staring at the cabin and was like, you said you like being kinky. You're pretty submissive, right? And I was like, uh, sure, but I just meant like normal rough stuff, nothing wild. And he started sounding a little annoyed, and his sentences seemed a little less carefully worded, like he was just spitting out the bare minimum of each thought. He said something about how some of his favorite people are those who can find pleasure and pain. And like if someone goes into shock enough times, eventually, it becomes like a drug and they crave more. Then something about how pushing a person into the deep end is the fastest way to teach them how to swim. At that point, I was scared enough to just assert myself and firmly said, Okay, well that sounds fun, but just not tonight. I want to go home now and this place is creepy. And he just sighed and gripped his keys tighter. Then, right as I glanced at his phone sitting in the cup holder, right before it occurred to me, he snatched it up so fast and held it in his left hand, kind of behind his head to make it clear he wasn't going to let me near it. I made this kind of, what? sound, and he gave me this almost I'm proud of you, son, half smile like dads do when they pat you on the shoulder. It was quiet, and he kept looking up and down at me for a minute or so, and then got a little more gruff and said, let's go inside. I have these friends you'll really like once you meet them. You'll feel a lot better, or something to that extent, 
but he wasn't even trying to sound genuine or comforting, like he'd been doing so earlier that night. Finally, I lied and spoke up to him and told him, I told my roommates and my friends I was meeting up with you before you picked me up. I sent screenshots of your face and some of the convo. They're gonna freak out if I don't charge my phone or reply to them in the next few hours. I tried not to make it sound accusatory, but more like I was just getting worried about my friends going crazy. But it was clear he knew what I was implying. At that point, he let out an exasperated grunt and started the car and drove away and kept the headlights off all the way back down the dirt road for some reason. Driving back, I got nervous about him stalking me and coming after me in the future. So I tried to apologize and tell him I'd be down to hang out another time. But tonight just wasn't great. He didn't say a single word to me the whole drive back and didn't ask me where I lived, although I didn't intend to tell him either. But he dropped me off at a McDonald's about 40 miles away from my apartment. And when I was stepping out the car, he suddenly leaned over and gave me a hard shove. So I almost fell out the rest of the way. And he grabbed my backpack off the floor and flung it out his window across the parking lot and peeled out with the passenger door still open. He broke my laptop, cracked my phone, and I had to ask a stranger to use her charger and call an Uber. But at that point, I was just so anxious to get home, I didn't give a crap. What's so weird is how, while it was happening, even though I was terrified, I guess I wasn't thinking about exactly what he was planning to do to me. I just knew I needed to get away. So it wasn't until I got home and got into the shower that I realized how messed up all that was and what might have happened if I'd have let him walk me into that cabin. I remember just being so shaken and smacked by the reality of it and almost felt like a panic attack. So I sat down in the shower with my head between my knees and cried until it ran cold. I got out, woke up my roommate just to tell him about it and he kind of calmed me down. So while I still have a grinder account, I really just use this as an ego boost. I'm reluctant to meet up with anyone from it now. Context. I have anemia. I am really bad at taking care of it as I eat no pork and try to limit my red meat intake. I often feel faint or dizzy. I also have anxiety which sometimes causes me to pass out. So it all started the weekend before Halloween, the 28th of October to be exact. My boyfriend was visiting from a town about an hour and a half away and was spending the weekend at my dorm which is conveniently in the same city as he grew up. I am an 18 year old female college student who works in retail. I was working the opening shift on this said day so my boyfriend went home to visit his family while I was at work. He planned to meet at a subway station just a few hours after finishing my shift but due to a subway closure he was running late. Not a problem, I thought. Then I realized I went to the wrong subway station. No big deal. I'll just hop back on the subway and go back down one station. I arrive at Determined Station a little anxious as I think I'm going to be late and there's no cell service. I couldn't figure out how to leave the station and kept ending up back at the subway train area where I began. Cue my panic attack. Luckily, it was a manageable one where I didn't pass out. I just couldn't breathe, that's all. I finally figure out how to get to the shopping area connected to the subway station and suddenly feel very faint. This causes my panic attack to intensify as I feel as if I'm going to pass out in an unknown area. I sit down on the floor and try to calm down, preparing myself for passing out. I spend about three minutes focusing on my breathing and calling my boyfriend, finding out he's about 20 minutes away. I decide to people watch across the hall at a Rexall pharmacy. I'm feeling a lot calmer, but still, like I'm going to pass out. I realize I don't have my iron supplements on me, and decide it's better to just stay sitting. Suddenly, a security guard comes out of the security office smirking. I think nothing of it until he walks right up to me. He tells me to stand up, 
I tell him it's not a good idea right now because I may pass out. Then he gives me two options. Walk over and sit on the benches about a hundred meters away or pass out in his office. I calmly explain that there's no sign saying I can't sit where I'm sitting and that I didn't do anything wrong where I'd need to end up in his office. He shrugs and says we could just hang out. I tell him I don't want to hang out. I stand up and lean against the wall, which satisfies him, but he walks away rather grumpily. Boyfriend shows up and all is fine. Fast forward to today. I work in retail. Nothing too hard about my job other than handling the rushes where multiple people need help at once, but it isn't that big of a problem. My manager has a conference call in the back, leaving me to handle the storefront by myself. Usually this would have been okay. I was talking to customers and folding some t-shirts when I heard an oddly familiar voice creepily say, Hey, guess you weren't feeling like passing out today? I hope it's one of my friends who knows about me being anemic and I laugh awkwardly and say can't be passing out on my shift. Then I look. It's the same security guard. I get really nervous. In the moment I didn't think much when he offered to hang out when I passed out in his office. Then thinking later, my boyfriend kind of hinted up how bad that would have been. Now I don't know if it's a coincidence he found out where I work or if he stalked me. However, I do work in a mall not too far from the subway stop I first saw him. So I'm leaning towards the optimistic side of coincidence. He doesn't look at anything in the store, but watches my every movement. He then tells me he needs to inspect our back inventory. I tell him I can't let him back there, and my manager is too busy to talk to him. Note, he's a subway station security guard, not this mall security guard. But I didn't want to investigate things while on the floor by myself. He then tells me to just go with him, and claims it'll be fun. At this point, I decide enough is enough. I tell him I can't let him into the back room, and if he keeps asking, I'll call security on him. For the next two hours, he sat by the elevator outside my store and just watched me work. Finally, he left. I thought he was gone after my shift. I'm sitting in the food court, eating some McDonald's fries, and who shows up at the table just two rows away from me? He does. He then asks me if the seat across from me is taken, to which I say yes. I'm waiting for my father. He laughs, smirks, then says sure, and goes back to his table. I quickly leave right after. Luckily, I boarded a packed bus, which he was not on, and cut through my college to avoid walking on the street in the dark. I hope to never see the security guard ever again. Creepy security guard who told me I could pass out in his office. Let's not meet ever again. I live in Manchester in the UK. It's an amazing, not too big, arty, musical, and electric city. I myself am a bartender. The bar I work in is gorgeous, as well as loved, but the street it's on is a bit dangerous, as there are a lot of muggings, drugs, and sadly, a few sexual assaults. Although it seems to go through periods of being cleaned up a bit again, Anyway, I mostly work day shifts, and this takes place around three years ago. It was about 2pm, and it was just me, i.e. a small female, and our small female chef at work. Our general manager had gone off to the bank. We had two customers in. A woman enters, and it was instantly clear she was either on something, or had mental health issues. We're not allowed to serve people who are too drunk, but having had an instance before where I confused a man with neurological issues as too drunk, I always try to distinguish properly before proceeding. The woman asked for a double brandy, and I realized she wasn't drunk, so I gave her one. She kept saying, thank you, miss. You're so beautiful, miss. I love you, miss. I would marry you, miss. And I thanked her and smiled, 
but was getting slightly scared at this point due to the intensity of the way that she was saying things. She kept complimenting me, and I kept thanking her, but something was off, and she kept leaning forwards like she was trying to grab me, then pulling back and laughing. Then things got pretty scary. She began talking to her hand as if it were a phone, and getting heated, yelling to stop following her and to leave her alone. She did this numerous times, getting more and more angry. Myself and the chef were exchanging glances, and not quite sure how to proceed without escalating the situation. She suddenly turned and looked at me again, and said, I don't like you anymore, miss. There's a black spider, a big black spider behind you and in your heart. I can see it, and I don't like you anymore. I just got out of prison for murder, and I have a knife, and I'm going to cut that black spider out of you. I'm going to cut your heart out. She was screaming this at me, and repeated that she was going to cut my heart out. And she had a bag so it was entirely possible that she did have a weapon. Plus, she just told me that she had just got out of prison for murder. There's nothing but the bar, and a little step that's keeping her from me. And I just lost it. I began having a full-blown panic attack, and cried my eyes out whilst crouching on the floor. I didn't know what else to do. I thought phoning the police would escalate her, it wasn't the smartest nor bravest move, but I was utterly terrified, and genuinely thought she was going to kill me. Luckily, my chef, who was a badass Spanish lady, decided to call her bluff, and went up to her and said, You need to leave, while ushering her to the door. And she actually did. I don't know if I'd have done that if she'd have left, since all of her attention slash admiration and hatred seemed aimed at me, and no one else seemed to be in view. Anyway, I was incredibly thankful, and the two customers rushed over to me and said they worked in social care, and had actually been texting colleagues asking them to send help with the police while she was ranting, as they didn't want to escalate her by obviously phoning the police. They came, took statements, and all was sorted, but I was shaken up for the rest of the day. It all transpired that she lived in a psychiatric residential home full-time, and was schizophrenic amongst other things, and had been on day release with a carer who had lost sight of her in a shopping centre, and she really did have a knife in her bag. I'm not sure if she'd shoplifted it or what, but that sent chills down my spine. As I said, if I had tried to usher her out or called the police, I have no idea if she would have actually stabbed me. She hadn't been in prison or murdered anyone though. Fortunately, it was all in her head. Regardless, I would rather never meet her again. At the time this event occurred, I was working as a hostess, server at a local restaurant in my hometown. Now my co-workers at this restaurant tended to be more flirty and touchy than at any other job I've worked. It was never weird or meaningful for it, the least part. It was just how it was. I was working there for about six or so months when the restaurant hired a new food runner named Alex. Alex seemed like a nice guy, but in all honesty, I don't remember much about him from when he was first hired because we only worked one shift a week together, which also happened to be the restaurant's busiest day of the week. He also tended to work the night shifts where I was always scheduled for morning shifts. After a while of working our one shift together, I noticed he was being more flirty with me than anyone else he interacted with. He began harmlessly flirting back and forth for a few weeks, and eventually he asked me out. I agreed, and told him I was free later that same day, so he could do something. Stupidly, I told him to pick me up in front of my house, and gave him my address. A few hours later, he came by my house and picked me up, and we went to a park to hang out and talk for a while. Everything was going great. We were kissing a bunch, 
and I was having fun. We then got back into his car and started driving around. As we were driving, he confesses to me that he wants to be my boyfriend and that he has wanted to date me for a while now. He also told me that he would stare down guys who were seemingly flirting with me at work until they noticed him and stopped. When he said those things, I thought it was a little weird, but for some reason, no red flags went off in my head. I ended up telling him I would think about it, and he offered to take me to a cute little lookout spot in a small city a little while away. I thought it would be cool, and pretty considering it would be getting dark soon, and we could see the city lights out there. We finally get there, and we were talking for a bit, and then made out for a little bit before I had him take me home for the night. After I get home, he's already sending me messages like, You're beautiful. I can't believe you actually went out with me. And I want to see you again. ASAP. And I told Jonathan at work about how lucky I am, and I can't believe I'm already starting to fall for you. The first date happened on a Friday, and we had made plans to hang out again on that Monday. I didn't want to rush into anything, and I also felt a little overwhelmed by him, so in response to the text, I simply said that I was going to bed soon, but I had a good time, and that I would talk to him later. Saturday rolls around, and I decide to take my dog out for a hike that was really far out of town. I get a text from Alex asking to hang out that day at 12. I told him I was down to hang out, but I wouldn't be around in time to hang out at 12. After I sent that message, I lost cell service and figured that would be the end of it. At about two, I turned the corner into my neighborhood to find him waiting for me parked outside my house. I was taken aback and asked why he was outside my house. He was beaming as I asked, and he said we were supposed to hang out. I told him that he hadn't made any solid plans and that I was surprised to see him outside my house. He told me he only had 30 more minutes before he had to go to work and that we should hang out. I didn't see much of a point, but somehow he convinced me, and we went to the park to hang out for a bit. He ended up being 30 minutes late to work, because he didn't want to leave the park despite my persistence that he needed to leave because he shouldn't be late for work. Saturday comes along, and I'm busy at work, and Alex walks in. I was really confused as to why he was there, because I knew his shift didn't start for another few hours. He comes up to me, says hi and then I look really beautiful. I said thank you, but I can't talk right now because I am busy trying to manage a late rush. But he kept standing around, watching, and being kind of weird. He is standing by me for a while, so I ask him if he wants to sit down and get some food, and he says no. So I asked if he just wanted to sit, because him just standing around me was making me uncomfortable, and he says no. So then I said, what then? What are you going to stand around here until I'm off? His response, yeah. At that point, I decided it would just be better to ignore him and focus on working. So I did. Eventually he got bored and left. I felt very weird, and even my coworkers mentioned how weird that was. Now I usually clock off around four every day. However, because of the late rush, we had that day I got caught late pleading side work. As I was clocking off, I noticed that it was 4.45 and Alex was late for his shift. I figured maybe he came in through the back and I somehow missed him, so I finished clocking off and looked outside at my car. As I look at my car, I notice his car parked right next to mine, with him in it. I stood there for a while, wondering why he wasn't coming in, until it hit me that he was probably waiting for me. I nervously tell my co-worker what I just saw, and she wishes me luck leaving and promises to watch me to my car. I walk out to where the cars are parked, and try to ignore him, but he tries to scare me as I go to unlock my car. He then gets out, and tries to kiss me. For some context, I had mentioned to him earlier that day, he came in that I didn't want to kiss him at work, because it was unprofessional. But now, I was out of work, he immediately went in to kiss me. After what had happened earlier that day, I didn't feel comfortable enough to let him kiss me, so I told him I didn't want to mess up my lipstick. It wasn't a complete lie. I had spent a lot of time getting my lipstick to look good that day, and didn't want him messing it up. I told him this, but he didn't listen, and kept trying to kiss me. After a few more deflected attempts, 
and him telling me it didn't matter because I was just going home. I told him I should go and tried to get into my car, which he was standing in front of. He let me in, and I rolled down my window to say goodbye. But before I could even get the words out, he comes through my window to try to kiss me. I turned away, but he kept trying to kiss me, even though I had told him not to. I said I had to go, and he finally kissed my head and got out of my window so I would leave. He was messaging me a lot that night, and I decided that I didn't want to talk to him because I was getting freaked out. However, that night, I get texts from coworkers saying that Alex won't stop talking about me and how happy he is that we are dating and how he just wants to take me to the beach after his shift ends. But he wouldn't know if I would go because I'm all about my makeup. At this point, I decided it would be best if we didn't have contact. The next day, we met up in person, and I told him that I wasn't looking for a relationship right now, and it wasn't going to work out. He asked if I still wanted to hang out with him that day, since we had made plans. For some reason, I told him yes, and we went to another park to hang out. We were sitting on a tire swing together, talking, and he pulls out his phone and starts recording me. I really didn't want to be on camera and blocked my face, but he kept shoving his phone in my face, telling me I'm beautiful. For a few minutes, it was really this uncomfortable back and forth of him trying to get me on camera and me saying I don't want to be. After a while, he gave up and asked again if I was sure that I didn't want anything from him, and I said yes. He then grabbed my face and started to kiss me. After this point, some things happened that I don't feel comfortable sharing. What happened left me with some minor PTSD that I'm trying to work through and has unfortunately already fractured and ruined some relationships for me. After what happened, I never wanted to see him again, and messaged him that I was sorry if I was unclear or led him on, but I don't want any form of relationship with him. He responded with paragraphs saying how amazing I was, and how he'll let me go for now, and to have a good future. I thanked him for respecting what I had said, and figured that was the end of it. He later sent me a breakup love song, but I ignored it. I figured that was the end of everything. However, the next time we worked together, he cornered me and started trying to ask me questions about why I didn't want to date him. I told him that he was very overwhelming and I was not looking for that. I didn't want to talk to him and just said whatever would end the conversation fastest so I could walk away. That was the last shift we worked together and thankfully, due to a great friend of the time, I was able to take off the only shift I worked with him for three weeks straight. When I was gone, he kept asking all my co-worker friends about me, and even TTIE to message me, asking me where I was. I didn't want any contact with him, and decided it would be best for me just to block him. About a month after everything, I got a Snapchat notification from Alex requesting to be friends again. I considered refriending him, asking him to leave me alone, and then blocking him. But after some thought, I figured that just blocking him would be the better opinion, so I did. Now three months after everything, I get an Instagram notification saying that Alex had requested to follow me. I was confused and a little freaked out because I knew I had blocked him. I then checked my blocked account page and figured out that he had made a new Instagram and tried to follow me. At this point, I just want to forget and move on. I asked a co-worker of mine who happened to be Alex's friend if he could just tell Alex to leave me alone. Hopefully it will get through to him. This co-worker told me that Alex has a history of charges and that he doesn't understand how far or is too far. He also mentioned that Alex has been in China and won't be back in town for another month. I'm hoping that he moves on and leaves me alone, but I'm worrying about what will happen when he comes back. I understand that this isn't the scariest story, and that there are some better choices I could have made. In hindsight, I realized that there were ways in which I could have handled everything better. That being said, what did happen should have never happened. I just want him to leave me alone and move on. I've been living in this state of fear, worrying if he will show up outside my house again or my work. So Alex, please, let's not meet again. I live in Alabama, in a rural yet woodsy neighborhood in a small town. 
I was 17 at the time, which was about two years ago. I was at home one night, hanging out with my little brother who was 14. We were playing Pokemon Go. This was around the time the app was most popular, and everyone was going out to parks or just the malls to look around and catch some with their friends. We were never the types of kids to go partying, or even go out with friends, as our mum felt it would be best to keep us at home. Because in truth, she never wanted anything bad to happen to us. She would always tell us about people she had met before at her work, and that she met. You know the kind. Just people she would consider strangers, whether they were drunk or just being plain creepy. We were smart kids, and knew to always watch our surroundings, and I always kept a pocket knife on me for whatever reason, but mainly protection in case I was put in the position to have to defend for myself and others around me. It was around midnight at the time, and we had been playing for a couple of hours, geeking out over it as we both used to play Pokemon all the time on our Game Boys, and we loved it as kids. My brother Anthony yelled from the other room in our house, and I could hear him running up to my bedroom door with the biggest smile on my face. Bro, you're not gonna believe this, but up the road, I don't know, maybe a mile or two, there's a nine tails. I was ecstatic over hearing it, and we decided to take a walk through the neighborhood to catch it, along with the other Pokemon we had seen, but none were as important as that. Now I'm no Pokemon Go fanatic or anything, but just seeing this Pokemon close by made us excited, and we knew we had to get it. So before we got to it, I just wanted to say where we live is usually very quiet, a peaceful neighborhood, without much ever going on. There might be the occasional neighbor walking their dog, or even neighbors yelling, but nothing to ever worry about, especially at nighttime, where it was basically dead, all of the neighbors and anyone around us were usually asleep, or at least all the houses were dark by 11. We headed out of our house and walked down our driveway, which is actually pretty long being close to a quarter of a mile, and then started down the road. The neighborhood itself is basically a very big circle, almost like the letter U. I won't say we lived in the middle of nowhere, but we may as well have been. From the beginning to the furthest in the neighborhood, it reaches about five miles total. Just really spread out and simple. While walking, we were having the best time, making random small talk and feeling like rebels for leaving the house, especially so late at night. We walked, it was pretty nice, and the stars were out everywhere and it was quite chilly. We both caught a lot of Pokemon, and even reached about three miles into the backwooded area of our neighborhood just to get this nine tails. We had been out for maybe an hour at this point, and the childish enthusiasm we had was short-lived. We had gotten bored quickly, considering it was just the two of us, and we did catch what we came for, so we decided it was time to head home. On the way back, we felt completely safe, fearless even, just because of how we were, and we felt nothing could bother us in our quiet little area. As was expected, there were no cars whatsoever out during that late. I don't really know when, but when we were about five houses, or what people consider one block away from home, we see a car coming from the back of the neighborhood down this really long road that stretches throughout, and of course, we thought nothing of it. That is until it reached us and slowed down a lot, almost stopping two feet behind us. I glanced back to see that it was a red 2007 to 2010 Mustang, with a lot of paint scraped off and the front lights missing. Their windows weren't tinted, but I wasn't able to see anything inside. We were just slowly walking along the side of the road, when I realized this was pretty strange considering the circumstances, and I felt pure fear rush through my head all of a sudden. 
They followed us for maybe 50 feet, which might have been two to three minutes, when I whispered something to my brother. I can't remember, but it was probably something like, man, you know what this looks like, don't you? And he nodded his head, with concern in his expression. I glanced over to my left, where there was a house with lots of trees surrounding the front lawn, almost blocking the house entirely. Anthony was standing on my right, more so in the road than I was, and this person, whoever it may have been, was closer to him than I was. This person was now driving on the left side of the road near us. The thought of someone jumping out of the car and grabbing him, or rolling down the windows and gunning us down there and then rushed through my mind, with all other types of thoughts as I was trying to figure out what the hell was going on and what they could be capable of. I'm used to carrying a knife on me at all times, but this was different. It was maybe 4am now, and I wasn't in the same clothes I had worn the previous day, which usually consists of jeans, which is where my knife was. Now, I was in sweatpants, and just long-sleeved shirts. How could I have been so careless? But it was then that we both had the same idea. Right as we both saw it in each other's eyes, we bolted up the hill into the yard and into the trees blocking our view from the street. We always thought we were hot shit and could be stealthy or tactile, but this situation really showed us how vulnerable we were. When we reached a point where we knew that they couldn't see us anymore, we dropped down and went prone, or down to the ground on our stomachs and watched the road from underneath the in-betweens of some trees and bushes while still watching the car. They saw us run away, but it was until we reached our hiding spot that they made a dead stop in the middle of the road for a few minutes. We both lied there terrified, filled with adrenaline from the fight or flight. What he, she, or God willing they might have been wanting or doing was unknown. But all we could think was that they were definitely up to no good. From a dead stop after what I assumed was them visualizing the area, they skirted off at 0 to 60 in 3 seconds, with the engine roaring and tires slightly squeaking. And they were gone just like that. Me and my brother Anthony lied there waiting for what seemed like forever. For both our hearts to audibly stop beating as fast. We had no idea what they wanted, or what could have happened if we just continued walking down the street, paying them no attention, as we would have done if they hadn't have slowed down and followed right behind us. Both of us were visibly in shock. We never said much of anything to each other during those moments. I'm just glad that we were quick on our feet. When we did get up, we ran through the backyards of some houses all the way to ours. We burst in through the back door, locked it, turned off all the lights that may have been on, and went straight to our mum. She happened to be awake, and scolded us for going out so late, and getting ourselves possibly abducted or worse. We watched out the front window from the house, expecting to see them again, and sure enough we did. That same red Mustang passed in front of our house three times, and then we never saw them again. And still to this day, I've never seen the same car. I've seen plenty of red Mustangs. My brother's friend even drives one, but never that one. Call it luck, being blessed, or whatever you want. To all who listen to this, I tell you that we made it away from a confused person seeking two kids out walking the long road and piqued their curiosity. Or we made it away from a real threat who decided to follow two kids and drive away so quickly in what seemed like they knew they were busted or outplayed. After thinking it over, I'm determined they spotted us and followed us from the deep part of the neighborhood. It creeps me out to this day to think that even though nothing really happened, it could have and might have been. Please stay inside at night. Don't put yourself in a situation that could end badly for yourself or others. Stay alert, watch your surroundings, always assure your safety for those you are with as well. 
be safe people, and to the person or persons following me and my little brother in the dead of night, I do hope we don't meet again. I graduated high school almost a year ago. I had really no urge to attend college or the military. I basically got stuck in my boring hometown for months, where I slowly became dependent on Xanax and booze. It was destined to repeat the cycle of white trash set before me by my parents and theirs before me. I knew I had to leave town, so I decided to sign up for a website you may have heard of called www.oofc.com. Worldwide Opportunities in Organic Farming. You pay a small fee and then make available a directory of organic farming operations that will feed you and allow you to live with them in return for a certain amount of work around the farm. The place I decided to commit to was a Hare Krishna community in the deep south. I got there and my car almost immediately broke down. It was a 30-year-old Chevy Blazer I bought on Craigslist for $500. Later on, I was to find out it was beyond repair at this point. The closest town was almost 20 miles away, so I found myself stranded and surrounded by the most unbearable hipsters. To be more specific, I'd say about a third of the population of the community were either first or second generation Indian immigrants living near the temple of religious reasons. Another demographic were aging hippies, also there for spiritual purposes but also running the small-scale organic farm located on the property. Everyone else, however, self-absorbed, condescending, right out of college, but vapid at shit hipsters. I basically kept to myself, but occasionally was forced into conversation about vibrating crystals and their three-year spiritual journey, no doubt being founded by their parents. I had been there for weeks and was desperate for a real conversation, and then Michael showed up. I had heard stories about Michael a couple of days before I showed up. He had left to retrieve an impounded car in a large city about an hour away. Everyone said he was lazy, insane, and he would spend hours up in his room doing yoga instead of coming down and working with the rest of us. He showed up late in the evening, going on about how he was going to really get involved with the farming and throw himself into Krishna work. He was in his early 30s. He looked like a balding, Hasidic Jew. His unwashed sideburns curled. He spoke like a stoner cartoon character. His sentences punctuated with and, uh, or, and like, giving his utterly fried brain time to figure out what others wanted to hear. He reminded me of many of the friends I left back home. We became fast friends, as he was the only person there who didn't give me the urge to bite my fingers off when he spoke. We were both from Texas, so we talked about the loony conservative teachers we had in high school, football, and of course, drugs. Every now and then, he brought up subjects that really sort of threw me off. He wasn't able to get his car out of the impound garage, so he schemed the best way to break it out. These plans involved firearms, pipe bombs, and telepathy. He told me he came to the Hare Krishna temple to befriend some of the gurus and learn Reiki meditation, a form of meditation used to control the minds and bodies of other people. He told me he believed he used Reiki once to seduce a woman at a party. This is when I understood his reputation. I simply nodded and laughed occasionally when he went off on these rants. I knew one day I would reach a saturation point of this absurdity but I could definitely endure a week more. A couple days later, we were eating lunch with one of the gurus. I was telling Michael about my trip to the giant field where the Branch Davidson used to be. He wasn't sure what the Branch Davidson was, so I explained to him about Wacko, David Korish, and the botched seize by FBI and ATF that led to the death of 76 Davidsons and four ATF agents. He was enraged. The government is always trying to silence people preaching the truth. That's so fucked up. I wanted to explain to him that David Korish was a sociopath cult leader, interested in power and nothing else, but he wasn't having it. Now I was angry. He was having a tantrum about a subject, and I had just explained to him. 
and now he's telling me I'm wrong, that Chorus was a martyr. This is when I saw the truly insane Michael. He was spitting red as a beet, pacing back and forth. I left the table and got back to work, but he followed me. After half an hour of this absurd argument, I couldn't handle it anymore. I'm not having this conversation with a fucking loon, Michael. How can I expect logic from you? You came here to get superpowers. The look in his eyes changed from anger to hatred. He got real still and went at me. Michael was a big guy, much, much bigger than me. He lunged at me, and I ran. As I ran, I went through my pocket, praying I had grabbed my knife before I left my cabin. I know it sounds ridiculous, but you don't walk my old neighborhood without some sort of protection. Plus, it was a pretty useful tool on the farm. Luckily, I had grabbed it and turned around when he saw it. He stopped and contemplated for about three seconds. He quickly turned around and finished his lunch. The next day, I pulled the temple president aside and explained what happened, and then we had to get rid of him. It didn't take much convincing. No one really cared for him, and he wasn't much help on the farm. I felt bad snitching on the guy. He was in a pretty desperate situation. He had no car, no money, and I can't imagine he had many friends. The temple president also informed me that he had been an alcoholic for 10 years and had come here to get sober. I found it very strange he never told me this. Later that day, I saw through my window someone drive up and hand him several suitcases to pack what little he had, and I saw them both drive off to God knows where. Weeks went by, and the whole encounter kind of faded from my conscience. Late one night, I got a text. Hey, this is Michael. We can get that car out for $280. Want to go traveling? I never responded. I wasn't sure how he got my number, but I figured he'd looked me up on Facebook or something. A few nights later, I was in the temple office using the Wi-Fi to make some emails. I was making the walk back to my cabin, and from the pitch black, I hear a lot of loud banging coming from a barn. I remember thinking it must be an animal, but also thinking it must be a pretty big one to make that much noise. I entered my cabin. The actual door to the cabin doesn't have a lock, but my bedroom did, so I used that one. I was pretty unsettled by the banging, but I figured my imagination was getting the best of me. Later that night, I woke up needing to take a piss. The cabin didn't have a bathroom, but we had a shared outhouse. I didn't feel like putting on shoes and walking around in the dark, so I figured I'd just piss in the sink. I know it's gross, but I am the only one who uses that kitchen. I opened my bedroom door and nearly pissed myself right there. Michael, completely naked, was scratching in a corner of my kitchen, facing the wall. I made a noise I wasn't aware I could make, something you could only hear Shaggy make on Scooby-Doo. This noise alerted Michael onto my entrance. All he did was glare at me and shook his whole body. I slammed my door and locked it almost immediately. I knew what he was trying to do. He was trying to pacify me with a reeking meditation. I called 911. I didn't open my door or even approach it until I saw the red and blue lights outside my window. Michael wasn't there when they arrived. My guess is he ran deep into the woods that surrounded the farm. I explained me and Michael's history and what had happened that night. There wasn't much they could do since no one seemed to know anything about Michael. I didn't even know his last name. I had to leave the farm shortly after. Calling the police was really frowned upon since I believe many of the old hippies thought they were still avoiding the draft. I didn't mind leaving either. I couldn't sleep knowing Michael might be out in those woods, angrier than he was before. I stayed up almost three days while I waited for my friend to come pick me up. My family is just your average Pennsylvanian family. We like to go to the lake and camp on weekends in the summer months. Usually, the lake is uneventful. My family camps in a campground, so when we get up, we go for breakfast. This town is full of old weirdos, meth heads and drugs. The people always stare at us, and it still happens today. This place that we eat at is very small and you go up to register to order. Anyway, we went to the restaurant to eat when I was seven. 
the drive-in was normal as usual, and my parents were getting gas, and I had no clue where my brother went. So I went into the restaurant by myself, which was a horrible mistake. When I went into the restaurant alone, an employee saw me and called me over. The man at the counter had black curly hair with no facial hair, and he looked pretty young to me. He said that his car doors opened up like a Lamborghini. Now looking back on this, it was probably one of the stupidest things to say to a seven-year-old. He asked me if I wanted to see his car. By this, I was kind of weirded out by this guy and didn't want anything to do with him. But I feared being rude, so I went with him. His car was blue and had a white stripe down the middle. Go see it, he said, and I started to get nervous. But I obeyed anyway and went to the car, and he followed me. I was right by his car when I heard my mother screaming, Bryce, get over here now. So I ran to her. She looked pretty pissed, and she was, and she lectured me about not to go with strangers, but my seven-year-old self wasn't paying attention. We still ate at the restaurant, and we had another woman take our order, but for some reason I never saw the man again. At the moment, my seven-year-old self hadn't understood why that guy approached me, but just a few weeks ago I remembered this story, and got very emotional. That guy could have literally taken me away, or killed me. And just like that I could have been gone, never to have been seen again. Kidnapping is something everyone fears in the back of their heads. For some reason though, I got lucky. Keep an eye on your young children. You never know when or where something could happen. They could be on your side one second, and the next they could wander off never to be seen again. Not everyone in this world is nice and caring, and it can happen to anyone at any time. I worked at Six Flags last year. Well, technically, a freelance arts company leasing vending spots there. I was one of the oldest people hired. Attending college while most of the co-workers were in high school, I took photos in a sort of old-timey dress-up shop it was honestly one of the most fun jobs I've had. I was hired back in March of 2018 and started work in April, when the park was open on weekends only before the official opening. I had been working for about a month, and the park was now open during the week for less than 10 hours per day, so I was only able to work all day, but was unfortunately the only one in the shop as college was on summer break. You see where the story is going. I was alone all day during the week, and had some co-workers on the weekend. I was so terribly alone during the day that I'd walk across the path to see my other co-workers out of boredom. When I was outside of my shop during the day, I began to notice a man hanging around my area. I'd mainly see him walk by very slowly, staring at me the whole time. I figured he was just shy, wanting a picture inside, and was too afraid or socially awkward to ask for pricing. Deep down, he gave me an uneasy feeling and I decided to ignore it because he was a customer in the park and was probably just very antisocial. I kept a smile and tried pulling in customers all day, every day. One day I smiled and waved at him. That was probably my big mistake. He walked over briskly to stand in front of me and stare at me. I was creeped out. I was scared. He then asked about prices after days of walking by me and staring. I breathed a sigh of relief and started going through my mesmerizing sales pitch. After I finished, he started to smile. Not a normal smile, one that made my skin crawl. He leaned in so close I could smell his breath. He asked me how it would be for him. He asked me how much it would be for him. I was confused, as I'd just gone through my price lists. So I stated that the prices were set and non-negotiable unless you were an art company employee or a park employee. He shrugged and walked off. When I ran through my sales pitch, a family had grown interested and wanted some pictures. So I gladly took them into the shop and had a wonderful time photographing them. While I was checking the family out and collecting payments, I looked up and the man was back, 
leaning against the chain barrier in front of my shop. The family collected their things and walked to the chain. The man had to move to the side for me to open it for them. I immediately closed it behind them as they tried pushing his way into the shop. I told him I was sorry, but only paying customers could come in. He wasn't allowed unless he was considered a purchase. He frowned and walked away. I waited a few minutes, tidied up the shop, and stepped back outside. It was almost closing time, so it was pointless. I had to stand outside, or else I'd get in trouble with my boss. I noticed him one last time that day. Across the way from me was a game, and I saw him hiding behind it, peeking his head out and looking at me. I can't tell you how scared I was. I wanted to cry. He continued to do this for the entire week, and I eventually began to ignore him, which he did not like. On that Friday, as soon as the park opened, he made a beeline towards me. I was out front organizing outdoor props, and I froze. I hastily dropped what I was doing and went inside, closing the chain behind me. He paced back and front in front of the chain, muttering to himself and looking at me. I was so terrified. I was going to run to the phone and call security if he didn't leave. He suddenly lurched towards, grabbing the chain in both of his hands. I will never forget this moment because my heart stopped and my blood ran cold. His eyes were wild and that same menacing grin was back. He started whispering about things he wanted me to do to him. It was disgusting. He was talking about how he loved me and all the sexual things he wanted me to do to him. He wanted me to put him in a dress and said he wanted me to humiliate him in front of all the people in the park. I was slowly backing up to the wall in my shop as he started yelling and laughing. I told him to go away. That I would call security if he didn't leave right away. He got even more angry and said something that keeps me up at night, even a year later. I'll be waiting for you outside of the employee exit. Meet me there or else. He gave that disgusting smile and walked away. I went behind the counter and started sobbing. I never imagined I'd have something like this happen to me, and now that it had, all of my, no all of my knowledge of what to do went out the window. I was crying like a little girl. I decided to tell my manager at the end of the day because I didn't want to be afraid of coming to work. When I told him, he was mortified that I hadn't told him sooner. He walked me to the secret exit to the employee parking lot so I wouldn't see the man again. The next morning we went to security to tell him. The next morning we went to the security office and I gave a description to all the parking security of what he looked like and what he normally would wear. I went back to my shop with two co-workers and not even five minutes later, here he comes, strolling over with an angry look on his face. I hadn't met him and he was furious at that. My co-workers noticed my panic as I ran and hid in the back. I hadn't told them of my situation yet, and when I did, they told me they wouldn't leave me alone even after shift was over, seeing as how I was the closer and they didn't want me to be left alone at all. I called security and told them what he was wearing so they updated information. They posted a security officer outside my shop. He seemed to disappear because of that. When the officer left to take care of something, he came back. Security, security realized that every time a clothed officer was around, he would hide. So they posted a plain clothing officer across from my shop, posing as a customer. I was being used as bait ultimately, but I felt it was important to get him out of the park. Security eventually apprehended him later that day as he was headed towards my shop. They asked me for identification on him, and I remember breaking down and sobbing. The officer comforted me. Finally, this nightmare was over. He never physically threatened me or wielded a weapon, but he was doing enough verbal threats to make me fear for my life. They banned him from all six flag parks around the country, revoked his membership status, and took him into custody. Unfortunately, as there was no violent act committed, they had to let him go. As I drove home that night, I saw him walking on the side of the road, and I immediately sped away in fear he would see me through the window and chase me. At least he couldn't get me at work anymore. 
I found out a couple of weeks later from one of my security friends that he saw my stalker being arrested in the town over. I went and looked up arrest records for the town later in the day and saw he had been arrested for indecent exposure, public endangerment, and public intoxication. I know what happened to me is not as severe as other stories, but it was one of the most terrifying weeks in my life. You really don't think something like this will happen to you until it does. Please, everyone, always notice who's around you at all times and be cautious of everybody. A few years ago, I had a scary Pokemon Go encounter. For a bit of backstory on this, I was a vendor for a company that I will not mention. My job was to drive to my set of stores, stock the products, build displays and other retail things. I loved playing Pokemon Go with my job, since I could encounter more Pokemon in different areas rather than the city I lived in. At this point in the game's history, Mewtwo was newly released, and it was more rare than it is now. For this encounter, I was in a city I rarely did any raids in, because I didn't know anyone who played. I finished my last store for the day, and pulled out my phone to see if there were any in the area that I could do. I see a few in the park, drive there, and go there so that I can play one solo. I see a group of kids with their phones out, and ask them if they're about to fight the raid boss. They said that they were, and so I joined them. For context, they looked like stereotypical Mexican wannabe gang members. I've raided with various people in the past that have gang background. When I raid, I usually look at the level of the players I play with to see if I need to use my best or I can get away with using a joke team. I assumed with the large group, I could use my joke team and threw in my own Mewtwo. We didn't beat the raid boss in time sadly, and they get upset with me that I threw in the incorrect Pokemon, and they didn't have one. Because I'm the new guy in town, they know I'm the guy with it, and they start saying things like I did various sexual acts for my Mewtwo in Spanish. I acquired it a legit way by the way. I'm half Mexican and half white, and I know what they can say. I apologize and explained that I thought we had enough people so I could use my unserious team. It was clear that they were not amused, they were pissed, and I didn't want to cause any more problems. The next thing I know, they're pulling out knives and threatening me. They're making gestures that I perform the sexual acts on them, and after telling them no, they pull out more knives and tell me to never raid with them again or they will kill me. I quickly run to my car and drive home. I tell my local group I play with and they were shocked. In all honesty, I should have called the cops, but I have no idea who they were in order to tell the officers. Seems so silly over just a game, really. So I work at a retail company and I have been for about four months now. About a month ago, we got a new worker, Jack, who works in the back. As I continuously go back and forth from the storefront to the break room located in the back, I am quite friendly with all the guys working back there. I never saw Jack before and figured he was new. I decided to smile at him and say hi. I continued to do this every now and then, and when I saw him, and we would always have the same lunchtime, so we would spend the time making idle chat in the break room. Now this was all fine and dandy, but I do like my personal time, and Jack would just sit and talk and talk. Whenever I was on my phone, and obviously gave clues, I wanted to just be left alone. I thought this was just annoying at the best. He then one day started to buy me candy, offer me his food, and then talked about this soup he was going to make, and ranting on about how amazing this soup would be. I kind of just acted interested with a, oh, cool, and he asked me if I wanted to try some multiple times. I just dismissively said sure, so he would leave me alone, and didn't think anything of it. 
He then started making me feel uncomfortable with all the offering of food and candy, and always asking me about my personal life. He asked me how my relationship with my dad was. I was naive and told him he wasn't in the picture, but didn't give him much detail. He then started talking about how he wanted more kids, and how he wants to find a young woman to give him more kids and stuff. I was getting creeped out at this point. It was constantly dismissive with him. I did ask him how old he was, because he looked young, maybe 30 at the most. He was 45, he said. That had alarms ringing for me in my head on why he kept pestering me and talking to an 18-year-old girl nonstop about kids and how he loves the female body. The last straw in pretending to be nice to this guy was when before I clocked out to leave, he rushed to me and told me he had a present for me. I didn't know what the hell this guy had, but he decided to pull out a bouquet of fake roses and gave them to me. They were obviously cheap and had congrats grad on it, even though everyone knew I congratulated high school last year. It was just very weird. He told me it was because I worked so hard. At first, I thought maybe he was doing this in some sort of fatherly caring way, but putting two and two together with my mom, I knew he was flirting with me. I threw them in the trash when I got home, disgusted that a grown 45-year-old man who knows I was 18 would talk about women's bodies with me and giving me roses. After that, I would text my mom any time we had lunch together, so her and I would sit in the car and I would eat to avoid him. Things were going good, I just ignored him from then on and avoided eye contact, barely talking to him anymore. I think he sort of got the hint. This is where the story should end, but it got worse than I could have ever imagined. Jack was starting to act up at work, cussing, and acting too comfortable around his co-workers. I was closing up yesterday night with my supervisor, and she mentioned it. We began talking about Jack. She mentioned how things are really bad with him, and I don't even know the half of it. I told her about how he gave me roses, and she was shocked. We both went to the office to cash me out and talked in private about it. She said not to give him my phone number, in which I replied I would never, since he was a creepy old man who wanted to fuck an 18-year-old girl. She said her and Jack had went on a couple of dates together, and kissed like twice, and he began sending her pictures of his, well, genitals, without any warning. I was disgusted, and found out he was also talking to her, asking her to give his, his babies and marry her. She told me he was married three times, and also told her about how he had a domestic abuse case in the past. So this guy beat up his wives. She then showed me how he would like snap and call her a fat cunt and all that crazy shit. And that soup he wanted to give me so badly. He and her made it together for the first date. She said she didn't want anything to do with him anymore, and I agreed. But again, I wish the story ended there. She started shaking and crying talking about this. She said he had been in jail before. I knew that he told me once about his drug dealing past in the 90s and how he changed and everything. But she told me he was arrested and put on trial for first degree murder. I was shocked to say the least. She started crying even more. How he knows where she lives and has seen her son since she invited him over to watch a movie with them. I told her to report him for the abuse of text and inappropriate pictures but she insisted on not because he knows where she lives, and she lives with her minor son. Shit gets even crazier when she texts me the court case she found on him online. Says he and his friends were in an argument about drugs, and he pulled out a 9mm gun and said he was going to kill everyone in the apartment. Reading this, my heart sunk. He was an average acting guy at first. It didn't seem super violent. But I now know he could flip on a dime. Continuing to read the report, it said him and another guy chased down one of his other dealer friends and shot him twice in the head at point-blank range. Jack was put on trial, and his friend who was involved in the murder was sentenced, but his sentence was reversed due to the lack of evidence, even though a witness did say he was there when the shots were fired. He definitely did do it, but somehow got his sentence reversed. My supervisor is so stressed and scared thinking if she gets him fired, he will legitimately come to her house and kill her and her son in cold blood like he did with his supposed friend. One chilling thing she told me was while Jack was at her house, 
him and her son talked about guns. And he mentioned how he used to have a 9mm gun that he loved. I told her I will come with her to our manager and tell her about all the inappropriate stuff he has been doing. He hasn't physically threatened her yet, but has said some pretty mentally abusive shit over text. And now knowing how crazy and bipolar this man can act, I am scared. He recently told me I was mean, and I just laughed it off. But who knows what this guy is thinking. He still has me on his radar of girls he wants to fuck, and it's honestly terrifying. I have been wanting to quit this job for a while, since management is shit, and now hiring my manager hired a murderer well known knowing the criminal past I am out of there. The man who shot another man point-blank range twice in the head gave me flowers and was trying to make me have kids with him. And one of the worst parts about this is the manager loves Jack. She was even talking about promoting him to supervisor as well. He has been disrespectful to multiple supervisors, is texting profane and abusive texts, and has sent dick pics to my supervisor. I really do hope he gets fired, and I hope my supervisor gets a restraining order or something to keep him away, because he is obsessed with her. I was just a second option, and I was good at deflecting him, thank God. So I am quitting my job soon, too much stress, and I cannot look at that man anymore without feeling legitimate fear and queasiness knowing what he has done and how he treated my supervisor and I. I hope I never have to see him again because he is so unstable. Who knows what he could do? I am also adding the actual police report because I am scared, honestly and truthfully scared of this man who can snap at any moment. I know it's stupid, but I am afraid he will somehow find this and track me down. It's that bad. I need the money, but this isn't worth it. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this collaboration with Night Stalker. If you did, don't forget to drop a like and leave a comment with your thoughts. And if you're new here, subscribe and press the bell icon to be notified every time I post. Night Stalker is a crazy good narrator, as you've obviously heard by now. So show him some love, go over to his channel, and check out his content. We actually have a collaboration featuring me over there right now. Link on screen and in the description. So let me know what you think. Go over to his channel, let him know I sent you, and we're going to have a good time. But until then, I'll see you in the next one.